predicament. And uh, so you can imagine how relieved we were when at the precise instant they were to show up on the other side of the moon, they were there. And everybody breathed a sigh of relief. And from then on, uh, uh, Apollo 8 was a very, very routine uh, reconnaissance mission. Now, the next time, the next job I was assigned to was uh, Apollo 12. And the reason I was assigned to Apollo 12 was because my lunar module, number 6, flew on Apollo 12, the second flight to the moon. So uh, I came down here to Cape Canaveral when my lunar module was being shipped down from New York. And I met it here, and I babysat my lunar module through all of the testing that goes along here at the Cape. And then I uh, was involved with the placing it on top of the, the booster stack, and I closed out the, the hatch for the final closeout. Immediately went back to Houston, and uh, my new job there was going to be as a mission control was capsule communicator. And this time I was Capcom uh, during launch. Well, during the launch of Apollo 12, you may remember it was struck by lightning. And boy, did that cause a lot of problems. Uh, the lightning bolt from a nearby thunderstorm, just as uh, Apollo 12 had cleared the pad, the lightning bolt hit it at the very top, the tip, at the escape tower, and the, the charge went down through the command and service module, through the booster, down the exhaust gases, and ground out, uh, grounded out on the, the pad. Well, on its way through the command and service module, it killed the electrical power and, and shut down the computers. And uh, the batteries immediately took over and it came right back up again. Uh, but every single caution and warning light in the spacecraft went off at the same time. So the crew was just flooded with information. Uh, back in mission control, uh, we, uh, the, the capsule communicator and the flight director, the, the, the chief guy in mission control, we're standing in the back of the uh, mission control center looking out over, we're higher, a little bit higher, we're looking out over all the consoles. And every console had flashing lights going on it. People were getting up, sitting down, uh, feeding information to the poor flight director who probably felt like he was drinking out of a fire hose. And, uh, but we had one console that was quiet, and that was a booster console. And these were the guys who were tracking the performance of the booster system. And that lightning bolt did not disturbed the booster at all, and it was on its way to a perfect orbit, and it was all automatic. And uh, so uh, the people from the booster section were telling the flight director, all, you know, we're right on trajectory, everything so far is going very fine. And so the flight director had to make a decision, shall I abort, or shall I let this booster take him into orbit and see what we can do when we get him in orbit. So he, he elected to put him in orbit, and once we got there, then we had to reboot the computers and, and reset the electrical system and check out all those systems to see if they were working okay. And everything looked good. So again, he had another critical decision to make. This time, he had to decide whether or not to let them go to the moon or whether they should stay in Earth orbit and do something else and then come back after, they, after a period of time. Well, he bit the bullet and told them they could go to the moon. That was called translunar injection. And they went off to the moon. They landed uh, in a place uh, on the moon that was only 600 feet away from a uh, spacecraft that had landed there several years earlier. And that little spacecraft was called uh, Surveyor. And Surveyor had a little robot arm with a scoop on the end, and it would reach out and scoop up lunar, lunar soil and bring it in close and scan it with a spectrograph, which would telemeter down to the ground exactly what the soil content was and it would dump the soil and go somewhere else and do the same thing. And as far as it could reach, it sampled all that soil. So um, as a result of all that sampling, we knew exactly what kind of soil Apollo 12 was going to be landing on. That was very, very helpful information. Well, in addition, the guys brought a pair of bolt cutters with them. And on their space, their, their walk outside the, on the lunar surface, uh, they went to Surveyor and they clipped off a few pieces of it and brought it back home again so that we on the ground could see uh, the effect of uh, on a piece of equipment that had stayed on the, been sitting on the surface of the moon for a couple of years, and uh, so that was really in, good, in, interesting information. Uh, the Skylab 12, I mean uh, Apollo 12, was a very successful successful mission. Uh, everything was fine except one of the cameras got pointed at the sun inadvertently and it killed the lens. Uh, but other than that, everything was just fine. So. 
they came back and we were done with the mission and, and I said, oh, surely this, this next, I'm going to get an assignment now, I'm due. But they had one more job for me and that was the lunar rover. Uh, another astronaut named Jack Lausman and I were assigned to the development of the lunar rover. That was our little dune buggy. And uh, uh, that little dune buggy was built in California in a 